Okay, thank you everyone for joining me today. I'm with Davis M. Giarini again, and we are going to be talking about writing. This will be one of the many, hopefully, uh, Writer's Corners style interviews I do with actual writers where we go in in-depth on what makes a good story and what a writer or new writer should be doing to make a good story. So thank you very much for joining us, Davis. Oh, glad to be here. Okay, so the first question, uh, this is sort of the end result after you've done your job, is who is your audience, and more importantly, who do you want to be your audience for the work you've just made? Well, with, uh, with Broken Roads, I guess the, the audience would be the 15 to 35 demographic for the most part, although really any science fiction fans. Um, and certainly there's a, a number of women have enjoyed it as well. Uh, science fiction is a bit more popular amongst men because it does deal with, uh, you know, it deals with science, philosophy, um, uh, history, you know. Uh, I believe it was H.L. Mencken that said women are obviously smarter than men because they don't waste their time with things like theology. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, really anybody that, that's interested in the genre, and it is a genre that's largely about ideas. Um, quite frankly, some of the best works of science fiction wouldn't really pass in any other genre uh, simply because the, the quality of the writing isn't there. Um, like Heinlein's a perfect example. I absolutely love Heinlein. He is one of my favorite writers and if I'm feeling down I love reading some of his stuff just because he's so upbeat and positive. But to be perfectly frank, he only writes three characters. Himself as a young man, himself as an old man, and his wife, Ginny. <laughs> now, are you influenced by any other writers? Like, I know we're Canadian. Is there, like, some famous Canadian authors? We have a whole bunch to, to look at. We had uh, the late Mavis Gallant. We have Margaret Atwood. We have all kinds of, of wonderful talent. Is there someone that you say, you know what, I'm going to give this a Canadian vibe? Because I know your story takes place in Ontario. Is that sort of where you're influenced by, or is it just because you happen to live there? Uh, it's because it's where I, it's, a, it's geography I knew. It's places that I knew, and I could actually write about in an honest sense. Um, I'll, you know, I have a major pet peeve with the, the Canadian literary genre. It's this, for the most part, it's this very desperate wannabe um, you always have to include vast landscapes because we're Canada. We have so many landscapes. <laughs> you know, look at the Arctic wilderness. It's yeah, like they, that can be done really well. Um, White Fang, uh, which I forget if that's in Alaska or or Yukon or whatever, but it's basically the same thing. I, except Alaskans, as far as I know, aren't desperate to have their own writing industry. They just write fiction. Uh, but it, but this desire to conform, to be deep, to impress the, uh, the uh, what is it, the Toronto, not the Toronto Star, the other rag that they have out there. And um, now Margaret Atwood, I'm, I'm not a fan of hers, of course, because she has yet to finish a single novel. And she also writes speculative fiction, not science fiction. Don't you dare accuse her of writing science fiction because it's not very scientific. Um, not a fan of her, but she legitimately earned an audience. And I will say, she is a very good writer. I just wish she would finish one of her bloody stories and stop hating on men so much. Um, but, but she's a good writer. And people buy it because she's a good writer, not just because she's Canadian. Uh, I, I think trying to... It, it's one thing when you write in a genre. You know, like, writing in a science fiction genre means that you're trying to reach out to science fiction fans. But hopefully... Hopefully you can also reach out to people that like other genres. You know, like you're, you're trying to make a good book that happens to be science fiction or happens to be a very Canadian story. But you shouldn't be pandering to that. I think that's where it goes wrong when people start trying to... They have this conception of what the audience wants and they just try and give them that instead of making a good work. In regards to uh, Margaret Atwood, I believe the science fiction you're referring to, I, th I guess her most popular work would have been The Handmaid's Tale, which is a dystopia future, which has a largely uh, feminist slant to things. Uh, that's what I think she's more popularly known for. Uh, in terms of your opinion of her, yes, she's an excellent writer. I think her prose, her diction is very good. Her pacing is excellent. The problem is, as you say, it's more about her content that I have a concern with. Even her short stories, which are excellent, they're just... There, there's like a slight problem and it destroys the whole thing. It really irks me that such a, 
an oversight was missed. But let's let's just shift away from Atwood for a moment, because obviously Canadianism is a big thing. Whenever you make anything, especially in, in Ontario, there's the OMDC, which if you have anything in French, they love you, or if they have anything about the Rockies or whatever, of course, they will want to uh, help you out financially in some fashion. But let's go back to our questions here. What are your golden rules for writing? What are the sorts of things that you do or do not do? I have my own, but let's hear yours first. Well, the big one, and I learned this from Stephen King, is the gotcha. It's, uh, it's actually a really nasty trick that you pull on the reader that you end every chapter on a cliffhanger. You know, you end every chapter, but you make it so that they can't stop reading there that you need to read the next chapter and the one after that. So you keep going through the whole book and you stay up way too late and you're late for work the next day. Uh, you keep it going and you keep it engaging and interesting. Um, you know, it, uh, Mr. Plinkett, I, I'm sure everybody knows who Red Letter Media is. Oh, yeah. uh, he, he quoted um, Billy Quiverstick by saying, don't waste my time. Do not waste your reader's time. You know, you're there to give them entertainment. Uh, and, and this actually even goes, this isn't just for fiction writing, but this is for nonfiction as well, is people read nonfiction for entertainment. You know, it's, if, if you, if somebody's actually out there researching something, uh, like I'm thinking of my friend Aaron Clary, like that, that guy will spend hours pouring through statistics and reports to like draw a conclusion, and then he'll put it together in a spreadsheet, which is entertainment. You know, like the, the, those long lists of numbers and figures that, you make you cross like that's raw information it's boring it's not sexy even when you're writing nonfiction, you're, you're you, you need to make it sexy you need to make it entertaining you make it accurate you know when you're writing a story you make the characters realistic you don't toss in a, a fake love triangle just for the drama but you keep it interesting the entire time you, you got to be thinking about your readers just so you know, uh, people listening, Aaron Clary, I believe, is the CEO of Asshole Consulting. He is a financial capitalist, or is he an investment banker? And he does YouTubes as well, and he talks about what to do with your money. So when I check that out, go right ahead. Uh, my three rules, these are general rules, which I have for most people. Uh, it's clarity, being concise, which uh, lines up with yours. And the third one is more of a, a lifestyle choice than it is a rule. It's called editing and that every writer should go through the gauntlet of taking their work and smashing it down and rebuilding it and rebuilding it and, and polishing it till it becomes exactly what it should be. And every, every single sentence, every single word, does this need to be here? You, know, you are, you are going to write the most beautiful, elegant, and wonderful sentence that just isn't needed. You cut that. I don't care how much you love it, because you're going to love your own writing. You, you cut, you cut, you cut. That's true. And now we're going to get on to the more important question, which I think we've already answered, but just to make sure of this, uh, what is more important to you as a writer? Is it your experience, so when you write you have a good understanding of what you're writing, or is it something called believability or verisimilitude? And what do you value for? Like, what is, the, what is the value put into this? Like, we can look at Hemingway, who believed everything that he wrote was true and good and honest, and that's what he was going for from experience, whereas there's... Uh, Mavis Gallant, she wanted plausibility. Uh, Harlan Ellison wanted you know, the same concepts. What is it that you go for here? Well, I honestly believe that any good fiction is going to be true. And, and any true fiction is going to be good. It's, it's a bit of a platonic ideal that you're striving towards. Um, you know, I'll give you an example of this. Uh, the, the movie Starship Troopers was made with very disingenuine motives. The, the book that Heinlein put together, and uh, he was writing Stranger in a Strange Land, which was like the giant hippie book that everyone loved, and then he writes this huge right-wing pro-Korea war book at the same time. Um, the book's all about uh, how being a soldier is awesome, how it's honorable, and how it's the toughest job in the world, and how everyone should join the military. Um, <laughs> the, the movie was, it was put together by a hardcore left-winger about, look how stupid these conservatives are, only evil people serve in the military. And yet, the movie has this huge cult following from people that are soldiers or, or people that celebrate the military. It, it's become a very right-wing movie, even though it's supposed to be attacking the right wing. And I think that happened because this guy was, he was putting together a very disingenuous film. Um, it, it was, 
Now, now Heinlein, some people have described his book as a pamphlet, and it certainly has a lot of arguments in it, but it's an honest-to-God description of what it's like being a soldier, just using the sci-fi setting to make it a little bit more fun, a little bit more interesting. Um, what, the, what this guy was doing, I think, was it Verhoeven? I forget. Um, he, he was trying to create political propaganda under the guise of fiction, but because it wound up being really good, it completely backfired on him. Uh, I've seen this several times, that genre fiction, when it's, when it's put together well, off, or not genre fiction, uh, message fiction, will accidentally promote the exact opposite message because a well-written story with, uh, and especially with Hollywood, when you get good actors, when you get good editors, special effects guys, when people who, who give a rat's ass actually get together and put this thing together, you wind up with a good movie that says a lot of truth about human nature, even if somebody like Marvel Studios is putting it together and all those people see is money. Um, so it's, it's the, the underlying human truth is what needs to come through. And I, I believe, you gave me the question before, I believe you had a question on writer's block, this will, which will kind of tie back to this. So for the, for the record, you're saying that your experience, which you believe to be true, is what makes something believable. They go hand in hand. Um, you really should write what you what you know, and, and vice versa. You should try and know a lot of stuff. You should try and get out there and experience life and have empathy for other people. And, um, and obviously, if you want to write, then you need to read. You need to watch movies. You need to, uh, you know, it's, you're not going to dilute your own ideas. I've heard some people say that it's absolute nonsense. If you haven't read a lot of books, then you have no idea how to write a book. You know, it's, it's not the plot. Plots are a dime a dozen. It's how you put the story together that makes it good. Okay, let's, let's go to the question you just asked, which is, if you do get writer's block, because this relates to that. So if you do, how do you get out of it? Well, there's, there's two forms of writer's block. Uh, the first is just laziness, honestly. And um, now, lately, I have not been <laughs> writing as much as I want to, because there's only so many creative juices that you have on a day-to-day -day basis. And... Um, as you know, I've got a lot going on right now, a number of projects, and you know, sometimes I just haven't had the energy to do writing after being creative all day long. Um, and so that's, that's a little bit of laziness. Now, if you're not doing anything creative, you just need to discipline yourself. It doesn't matter if you feel like writing. You're going to sit in front of your computer and not write. You know, you're not going to do anything else. You're just going to sit there with a Word file open, not writing. Yeah, I've had days like that. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know what? Once in a while, you're just burned out. You know, you need to spend an entire day playing some video game or something like that. Something really non-challenging. The other type, though, the other type is when you, you put something into your story that's an artificial construct. Uh, you put something into it that, that lacked truthiness, that did not, did not gel. And it's a crit critical plot point or something that you, you put in there that you feel like it needs to, it needs to be there for the story. And, and you're, just, you're not thinking about it. And it's that flaw. It's that artificial, uh, not, not even deus ex machina, but like this, where, where a character does not react the way they should react. You know, they react in a way that's convenient for you. That's where your writer's block is coming from. The reason you can't figure out where the story is going is because you're not listening to your muse. You need to go, that thing that you put in there, you need to pull that out and you need to listen to your muse. You need to, to write the story the way it needs to be written, not the way you want it to be written. That's interesting because it reminds me of a quote by J. Michael Straczynski where he talked about writer's block and he actually never had it because what he does with his characters is he imagines his best friend and he knows everything about his best friend like if he walks across the room and stubs his toe he knows exactly how they're gonna react and that's how he writes his story he just gets the character he puts them in the scene and he doesn't even second guess what's gonna happen he knows exactly what this character is gonna do and it sounds like you just described what this the idea you don't have a concept of who your character is you're not gonna be able to write what that character is or what they're gonna do yeah yeah if you have a manic pixie dream girl in your story, okay. you might get writer's block because there is no such real thing. There are girls that act like manic pixie dream girls, but they usually have mental problems. Um, uh, did you happen to see the movie, what was the movie about the guy beating up his girlfriend's, all her exes in video game? 
video game world? Oh, uh, uh, Josh Kirby versus the world, something like something that. Something like that. Yes, you're right. Yeah, that was actually him dealing with the borderline. The, the, the reason that movie worked, even though the, the ending should have been him arrested because of a false accusation or him winding up in a mental asylum, um, the reason the movie worked is because they accidentally create a metaphor for, for dating a borderline, where him, him having to beat up all of her exes, this is because she is emotionally attacking him for all of the, um, you know, air quote drama she went through with her exes. Was this an actual, this was, this was Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. Was this a, yes. I, didn't, I didn't actually see it, but was this a satire on that sort of, like a comical fun satire? Was that just like, okay, this is serious, but we're going to have video game stuff in it as well? Well, no, I didn't even realize it was about that. Oh. Um, the same thing goes for um, Chasing Amy. Chasing Amy is about a borderline. Right. This guy winds up destroying his business, his friendships, and everything, pursuing this woman who pretends to be a lesbian but isn't, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and just winds up a broken shell of a man by the end of the movie. And I have a feeling that this actually happened to Kevin Smith, but he doesn't know he was a victim yet. Poor bastard. Well, let's hope it didn't happen to Ben Affleck anytime soon. Oh, oh it couldn't happen to anybody more deserving, if you ask me. Um. <laughs> hey, he's Batman now. We gotta give him props for even getting that role. So we'll, we'll just leave that alone for a time being. Yeah, I just don't want to see any of the Geely material appearing in the movie. Oh, no, no, no. That's worlds, worlds collide. Let's not do. Let's not go there. But but this is actually both of these are interesting examples where, like, chasing Amy. Amy is supposed to be this wonderful, mystical, magic pixie dream girl that he he could just never catch this amazing wonderful angel of a woman um you're, you're not going to meet a real angel not not you know in the dating market anyway and um and so even though he's trying to write this he accidentally writes a real story underneath that so you know sometimes if you have a manic pixie dream girl and you don't realize you're actually writing about a crazy damaged person despite that you can write a good story but if you just have a girl inserted that needs to fulfill this role, etc., then it's going to be terrible. Then it's, it's going to be fake and artificial, and you're just painting by the numbers. As this leads into our next uh, question. I'm going to set it up for a bit. Uh, very popular stories nowadays, uh, ones from 50 years ago, uh, even the fantasy genre with J.R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire series. People love what has you know, popularized over the TV show. Uh, his writing is just long and there's all these characters and there's all these plots it sounds like a soap opera that just is episodic it just keeps going and going and he hasn't even finished there's like there's no there's no there's no end in sight with this kind of storyline the same with let's say or actually differently than let's say a character uh in an ayn rand novel ayn rand has a lot of philosophy she puts this in the form of fiction and she essentially turns her books into mini miniature soap boxes she stands on and every scene is her opportunity to philosophize. Now, that's fine. They, they can do whatever they want in their stories. But to you, what's the most important element in your writing? For example, what do you really want to convey? Is it to have a soapbox like Ayn Rand? Is it something dramatic? Is it to make something entertaining? Or do you want to teach something along the way? Well, you know, like I'm, I'm a guy that's very interested in ideas. Um, Politics, philosophy, theology, these are all things that really interest me. And so that's what I write about. Uh, but one of the challenges that I find, uh, one of the things that I think I accomplished quite well with Broken Roads, was to put these ideas into conversations. Not didactic lectures, but having two people converse in a natural manner and arriving at these conclusions. That's, that's one thing I noticed about your stories, the characters, they're very simple and they're very believable as opposed to saying, oh, we're going to get uh, a Kawhi Chang King sort of guy who has this philosophy about life, he's military, and he, ha he knows how to treat everything. I was expecting some sort of road warrior philosophy, but it actually came across as just two guys who came from different backgrounds just looking at the world and going, hey, this is, this is what it is. And I don't know if that was intentional. I don't know if you wanted to go with other angles with that, but it sounded very believable. And it, that, it was that sort of relationship that I enjoyed. What I ex was expecting, again, was the philosophy. I wanted, to, I wanted more of it because you certainly had loads of opportunity to, to wax on about just about every, like, all kinds of things. 
and you never actually went there because it wasn't re relevant to what was going on. Well, and, and that's exactly what you should be doing. It's leaving people wanting more. You know, don't, don't keep going until they're sick of you. Um, now, don't get me wrong. I, John C. Wright argued that Atlas Shrugged is the best novel written in the 20th century uh, because every bit of it is just perfectly aligned with what it wants to do, what its goals are. Uh, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Um, but, it, but it is very much didactic in what it's yes. telling. Um, whereas where it, what I was trying to do with Broken Roads is, uh, is I was trying to create a good story. And, and even when it comes to philosophy, when it comes to the YouTube videos I make, um, I want people to think, not, not agree with me 100%. I don't have a perfectly worked out uh, philosophy of being. Um, Ayn Rand did. I think she was wrong in a few aspects, but she didn't. <laughs> she had a, a fully worked out metaphysical worldview that she was trying to present in this novel. Whereas I try and explore and understand the world better in an objective, measurable, consistent sense, but I, I don't claim to have a perfect understanding. And so in particular with this book is I don't fully agree with any of the characters and all of their views. Many of their views are influenced by the background that they come from. You know, again, I, I can't have somebody quoting something of somebody born in 1981 like I was. Like these characters weren't born in 1981. They were raised in a completely different society. They're going to have completely different perspectives. And so it, if you're, unless you have a fully worked out, unless you're making Atlas Shrugged, uh, your characters should be real people first and not, not lectures. You know, like the first Matrix was great, but it fell apart after that when the special effects got old. I'm actually uh, reading Atlas Shrugged right now, and yeah, it's, it's, very, it's very preachy, and that's, that's one of the, it breaks one of the rules of writing for me, which you have to be concise. You have to give me a character who has a plot, who's going somewhere with this plot. And that's kind of like when I looked at your story with, uh, I think the character's name was Falcon. Hopefully this isn't a spoiler. He seemed like a really interesting character. And I was like, you know what? This better be something, there's better be a payoff. So I'm expecting a sequel where something happens with this guy. Because I'm just like, Chekhov's gun is sitting on the wall. I'm waiting for it to be fired. And it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> so that was one thing I was hoping for. Didn't happen. Well, you know what? That, that's another good rule of writing. Do not use tropes appropriately. Don't, don't Chekhov's gun something and then just leave it sitting on the table. <laughs> you got to do something with it. You know, it, it's, there's subverting expectations and then there's... I, I, like, I, I love the uh, Song of Ice and Fire series, but Martin is getting really nasty with his characters. You know, it's like, stop killing off the ones we like so much. I just want to know what's going on with, in his brain because... There's, there's really no, there's really no pacing. There's no continuity. It just, it's just a big ball. It's just a big ball, and it's it, we call it the plot ball, and it just goes in every which direction. And I don't know who I should be cheering for, who I should be hating. It's, it's a big mess. And I, people like it because it has sex and violence and all sorts of medieval magical things, and that's great for fantasy authors or fantasy writers, but. Well, and it's refreshingly low magic, too, because yes, uh, yes. The, the whole D&D &D era, you know, D&D like &D is a great role-playing game. It's a great rule system for a, a role-playing game, but it's a very bad setting for a novel because the, the magic is just silly. Like, if, if you really think about it for five minutes, the D&D &D universe, they should have a higher standard of living than we have in the present day. Like, the, the magic is that powerful and that easy to access. Um, there's no excuse for it being medieval, if you think about it for five minutes. So for a novel, the very similitude just falls apart. It, it becomes silly, the amount of magic and people are killing gods. And it's like, oh, what's going on here? So, so actually having like a medieval world where people still have to crap in the bucket was uh, <laughs> quite refreshing. Well, I believe that's all the questions I have for you. Uh, when can we expect uh, even a teaser of your next novel? Is it going to be this year? Is it going to be next year? What's the deadline for this? Well, you know what? I really need to finish, finish this film first, but the novel's second priority for me right now. 
you know, after like, like day to day, you know, I got to keep writing, making YouTube videos. You know, that's, that's my day to day business. Um, finishing the movie is the, the next priority. And then after that, getting this sequel done. It's about half written right now. And, um, you know what I was saying about that, that plot device you put in there that didn't work? That, that's one of the problems I ran into is I, I put something in there. I need to rework it and, and smooth it out a little bit. But, uh, but it is about half written. And it's, it's all plotted out. I know where everything is going and where the, the climax is, etc. cetera. Uh, I just need to actually sit down and write the bloody thing. So, That's good because every, every writer, this is what I, I say in general, it's one of my golden rules. You should know your beginning, your middle, and your ending. And the rest is just blood, sweat, and tears. You just write it. Oh, and uh, one last bit of advice. Uh, don't tell people about your ideas. As soon as you tell them about your ideas, you no longer feel the need to write them. So don't, don't keep your ideas secret. Everyone has to be a hermit and close them off from humanity for about two months and then come out for food and air. And, you know. the, the reason that writers dedicate their books to other people is because you are borderline abusive to your loved ones when you're writing a book because you have no time. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's actually probably true. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for your time, Davis. Uh, I'd love to hear back from you in another few months whenever you do have your uh, exit from your cave of writing and you have something to show for it. Oh, and I will definitely be here. Okay, great. Uh, we'll do it. Thanks for listening. This has been the first episode of Writer's Corner. If you have any suggestions or questions about your writing, leave them in the comments. And if you think there's an author you'd like me to interview, please leave a comment as well. If you have any stories or scripts you'd like me to look at, please also send them my way.